Good morning. It's good to see you here. Uh, we're pretty lucky. We have avoided most of the worst storms around here, I think, last night. So there may be some families that need our prayer today who were involved in that severe weather, so keep them in mind across our four area. Uh, if you're a guest today, we're just so glad you're here, and uh, we hope to feel welcome. If you have any questions, just turn to anybody around you and ask for information. Uh, Attention of the ushers and they'll help you. A time was telling me that somebody uh, may have lost a pair of glasses. It looks like a uh, lady's glasses to me, but uh, here we got a lot of way to turn them in. But uh, Tom will have those in the back, so if you are looking for a pair of glasses or know somebody that have lost those, uh, if they're not tight today, continue to have those in the box. We want to remember uh, Barbara Street is in the hospital, Carl's wife, I believe, and uh, uh, keep praying and praying this week. Uh, she's in the Holy uh, Uh We want to remember Chip Burke and his family and the loss of his sister Becky, who passed away, and it's going to be uh, buried tomorrow at the uh, Pleasant Ridge Cemetery, Chip, and be in it's good to see Susan Kirkpatrick back. Yay! Max is here. He's part of the kitchen crew this morning. There's a fun bunch of folks over there that's fixing the meal. So don't forget, after we leave the service today, there's a, there's a meal over there. Uh, everyone here is welcome to go. Uh, there's no charge. So we would like a donation. We would like a donation so that we can have a quite of expense. So it's a lot to keep with you now. Improvements we have on the ground too, so remember that. Also, I'll make sure that you uh, register your name on the attendance pad and somebody tear that sheet out, pass it down, and offer play this morning. Uh, the pictorial directories, if you uh, have a major appointment, please do so. There's information in the bulletin about how to have contact for that. Also, uh, next Saturday is the Taste of Pleasant World. That's going to be really, really good. We're going to have all kinds of good recipes. In so many good cooks in this church, that's just unbelievable. And they're going to have holiday things, and there's going to be a cookbook available. So uh, invite your neighbors, invite your family. Uh, we have tickets available, $10 to get in. You can just come to the door and get in, but we'd like to have some of them. So if you get a ticket, I've got some. So well on the uh, team that's raising money for this, uh, we'll be able to have tickets just ask around. If you're participating in that, please bring your food by 10.30 so we can get everything set up in the fellowship hall over here before people start coming in at 11.30. There's a lot of other announcements in the uh, bulletin. Look through those. Uh, there's one special announcement that doesn't happen very often around here, but uh, Beth and some kids have a birthday. Here now, we're at the Lord. This comes from the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter, where uh, 
Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. This is the word of the Lord.
Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, you can instruct the hearts of the men and women that gave us the scriptures. So instruct our hearts this morning that we might understand them and apply them to our lives. We pray in Christ's name. You know, it must be hard to be a missionary in the world today. It's always been a dangerous undertaking to be a missionary. It's always been risky in several kinds of ways. But today, it's certainly, especially risky. You don't know what kind of angry people you're going to run into today. Today, the, the different religions of the world, the different cultures, seem to be at war with one another. And though you go out and preach Christ, uh, people seem to think you're preaching the American way of life or something like that. And you, have, you have problems wherever you go as a missionary. But it's not just people that are overseas that have trouble being a missionary. It's hard to be a missionary right here in our hometown, right here in the Dothan Road. You're going to run into skeptics. If you're going to try to give a witness to your neighbors, to the people you run into at work, to the people you go to school with, uh, it's not necessarily going to be an easy thing. And a lot of people find it hard to give a witness. A lot of people find it hard to be a missionary. But there is no doubt that's what we are called to be. Every one of us are called to give a witness to the people around us about who is Jesus Christ and what he can mean for us. Uh, the story is told by one preacher about uh, this little boy and his uh, sister <coughs> who are sitting on the couch and the father's across the room and the little girl says to her little brother David, says, David, do you know about Jesus? And David thinks, well, maybe he's going to hear something different. So he says, no. And she says, well, sit down and sit still and let me tell you, and I want you to know it's really important, it's real scary. And so he, she starts telling David about what Jesus means and all the things that you've got to do about how he died on the cross and about how you've got to believe in him, you've got to be baptized and all these kinds of things. And after she finishes telling her story, she says, now David, do you want to go to heaven and be with God and Jesus and daddy and your big sister? Or do you want to go to the lake of fire and the devil and be burned for eternity? And David looked at her and says, I just want to stay right here. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people can sympathize with that. that uh, it's hard to uh, get your arms around the kind of testimony that we have to share. But that's exactly what we're supposed to we're supposed to make our testimony. We're supposed to make our witness in a way that means something and is appealing to other people. Paul Mark, a great uh, theologian, was talking about what it means to be a Christian. And he pointed to this uh, picture that was on the wall behind him. It's a picture of Jesus on the cross, and there's his mother off to one side. And off to the right is John the Baptist. And he said, You see that center? That finger of John the Baptist, that's where I want to be. I want to be that finger. I want to live a life that points to Jesus. There's nothing more important for me to do in my life than to be that finger. And he talked about the, the, the importance of spreading the word of Jesus Christ. And he says, you know, when God created the world, when he created the universe and all the planets and the stars and the moon and all the animals, he never broke a sweat. And he said, when Christ died on the cross, he sweat great drops of blood. It was a much greater task. It was a much greater purpose that he undertook than all of creation. There is nothing more important than what God has done in the world than to give us his son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. And all of us are called to be the people that point to Christ. And help other people to find Christ. And you and I are in the season of Lent. And if you're a good
appropriate, Methodist, Purpose, Pain, or whatever, you know all about that. You know about the seasons of the year. And you know, Lent is the time of year when we're supposed to feel bad about ourselves. Lent is the time of year when we're supposed to do all our repenting, and we're supposed to catch up with all of our sins and re-examine our lives in preparation for celebrating the death of Christ on the cross and the resurrection that comes at Easter Sunday. And it's important that we do that. It is important that we evaluate our lives from time to time in the light of the scriptures and see how we stand in relation to what God has called us to be. And often we find things, always we find things about ourselves that need to be different, that need to be better. But that doesn't mean God doesn't like us. It doesn't mean we are bad people. The fact that we have done bad things, the fact that we are not all we could be, does not mean that God is just looking for a reason God loves us. And God sees great potential in every one of us. And God calls us into this season that we might be more of what we were created to be. Now the story today takes place in a little town called Sychar. Jesus had been down to Jerusalem, Judea, the area around there. He had been preaching. He had been baptized by John. And now he was getting more disciples than John the Baptist, so he was starting to draw attention. And he knew they would try to arrest him, so he decided he had to leave Judea, and he was going back to the Galilee. And he had to travel through the country that was known as Samaria. And he stops at this little town where there's a well, and his disciples go away to buy food. And he's sitting there at the well, and this woman comes up to him. And he... Uh, enters into a conversation with her. He simply says, uh, give me a drink of water. And she says, why, why are you talking to me? Why, why would you address me? I'm a Samaritan. I can tell you're a Jew. Jews don't talk to Samaritans. Why would you be talking to me? And he says to her, look, if you knew who it was that was asking you for water, you would ask me, and I would give you living water, the water that would spring up in you and, and become eternal water inside of you. And she said, well, it sounds like a great deal. Give me some of this living water so I don't have to come to the well anymore. And uh, she wants that blessing. She wants to have the gift of eternal life within her. And then Jesus says to her, go and call her husband. She looks at him and says, I don't have a husband. I don't have a husband. He says, You're right. You, you don't have a husband. You, you've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. You're right when you say that you don't have a husband. She says, I stand in front of the right and she begins to ask him questions. And he begins to open to her the picture of eternal life. And she catches some of the vision. That Jesus has to share with her. About that time, the disciples come back from looking for food, and they find Jesus there, and he said, What are you doing talking to her? She's a woman. Like he didn't recognize that she was a woman. And she goes away and she begins to tell the people that she knows about this guy that's down at the well, and how he told her all about her life. And she begins to explain to them how this man has opened her eyes about herself and about her possibilities. And they come to believe in Jesus because of what she says. And they come to see Jesus and they say, hey, this is fascinating. Would you stay here and tell us more? And Jesus stays in this little town of Sychar for two days, instructing them in the gospel. And he goes on about the this is one of the great stories of a witness that somebody gave in the Gospels. Here is somebody that hears about Jesus and tells the story and other people come to believe in Jesus because they told the story. Now would you pick this person to be the first witness for Jesus Christ in the Gospels. 
Is this the kind of person you would think that God would call to be a missionary, to be an evangelist? There is this amazing relationship that Jesus has with this person. And for one thing, immediately, you know, he's talking to her when other people in his position would have talked to her. It would have been easy to disrespect this woman, but he shows her respect and concern. He knows her. He understands her. He can see deep into her heart. And he does not despise her, but he loves her and he understands immediately what she can be. And what she can mean. And so he shares with her the gospel. And she becomes this incredibly effective witness in telling other people about what Jesus has done for them. Now, you know, a lot of us think what you need to be to be a missionary, what you need to be to be a witness for God is you need to be a very good person. You need to live an exemplary life. You should appear to be a Christian in every aspect of your life before you could possibly be a witness to the cross. But that's just not true. There have always been people who tried to look perfect. Jesus has this running battle throughout his ministry with the people in the religious world of his time who tried to look perfect. There's the Pharisees, there's the Sadducees, there's the hypocrites, these super spiritual people. And he doesn't like any of them. You know why? He says they're phonies. They're acts. They put it on. In one place, he calls them like whited graves. Like somebody's painted white on the outside, but inside, they're full of corruption, blackness. They make phony testimonies. We've known phonies. When I grew up, it was all these TV preachers who used to have. All of them turned out to be hollow men, one way or the other. Each one had their own flaw. And in today's world, I guess it's a Catholic priest <coughs> held up to such scorn in recent times. There are a lot of times when people that we think religious and look religious turn out to be very ineffective. In fact, as they turn out to be disastrous. <laughs> These two women have written this book about how to get married, and then they have another book on how to stay married, how to enjoy being married. The only thing is they've had six marriages between them. <laughs> 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 I think they gave you some good advice. Maybe they've made all those things. I don't know. <clears throat> Sometime ago, Reader's Digest came out this advertisement that went to people's lives. And our biggest homes and it advertised financial products of some kind. If any of us have faith that with the grain of a mustard seed, this will yield results for you. And they, they have a little seed really known to the, to the car. And uh, they got a letter back from a guy who took the seed and planted it. And he said, it had tomatoes on it, though. It didn't look like a mustard seed. <laughs> People know about phonies. People know about things that aren't what they appear to be. And you do not have to appear to be perfect in order to be a witness for Christ. That's not the kind of people that Jesus picked. He picked real people. Fakes don't work. But people who have a need for Christ and have a changed life become incredibly effective witnesses for Christ. So if you are somewhat less than perfect, if you've been a real scoundrel in your life, God can use you as a powerful witness for Him. God particularly loves you. And calls you into his service. Uh, Jay Kessler is a pastor of this enormous Baptist church. And he was uh, 
running a book in our life in his church. And he told a story about this couple who was in his church, and he said that uh, a terrible thing happened in their life one day. Uh, their son was arrested for armed robbery. It said they were just ashamed. They were just totally ashamed. They were embarrassed to no end. I mean, they were concerned for their son. They were worried about their son and what kind of him. But he said they were just afraid to face people. She said she wouldn't go to the grocery store because she's afraid somebody would see her and talk to her. And time goes on, and finally they decide it's time for them to go back to church. And they told this horrible story of what happened to them when they went back to church. They said there were people that came up to them and expressed concern for them and said, We understand, we we'll be with you and whatnot. said, But the amazing thing. And on and on and on, all these people came up with their stories about the tragedy in their lives. And here was somebody at last they could share it with. The fact that we are sinful people is something God uses. And He can use us for great things. Just as we That's what He's looking for. There is no reason for anybody to say, I am not good enough. Let me tell you that you cannot be bad enough that God cannot use you. <coughs> I want you to understand something. I'm not saying what we need to do is have a, a congregation made out of people during Christmas. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to say what God is looking for is for all of us to be as bad as we can. God wants us to be good people. And when we come into the church, we come into the church to have our lives transformed. And we come to be made better people. And the overall greatness of Christianity is that we become better people. That we become more Christ-like people. That message hasn't changed. But here's this message. In the middle of Lent, when you hear all this stuff about repentance, don't let it turn into shame. Don't let it turn and make yourself believe that God can't use you. God can use you. God can use you. Like the woman at the well. Jesus is looking for you. Let us pray. Forgive us, oh Lord, because uh, sometimes we think we have to be perfect to be acceptable to you. And yet, you accept us just as we are. You would make us into the people that you want us to be. Help us, O Lord, to do what we can to tell our story, the real story, about how you've changed our lives. We make our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let us continue our worship as we receive our time.